Thank you, Alois. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the ACRL DLS Research and Publication Committee Spring Author Forum. My name is Lindley Homel, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Research and Publications Committee. Our featured author today is Amanda Ziegler. Amanda's article, I Want to Be in the Room Where It Happens, Using Curriculum Mapping to Support the Information Literacy Goals of Online Programs, was featured in our committee's last top five articles post about collaboration as outreach. Amanda is the Director of Library Services for North Central University. North Central's mission as a fully online, regionally accredited nonprofit is supported by the 100% remote team that supports its fully online library. Amanda received her MLIS from the University of North Texas and is an active member of the Distance Learning Section of the Association of College and Research Libraries. Her research interests include graduate student success and first-generation college students. This afternoon, Amanda will first talk about her article and then we'll leave the majority of the session open for you to ask questions. Please use the chat option in Zoom to ask your questions. While you're encouraged to submit your questions at any point during the session, we'll wait to ask Amanda your questions until after her presentation is concluded. So thank you again and Amanda, the floor is yours. Hello everyone. Um, I wanted to say thank you to Lindley and Tracy for, and their committee for inviting me to um, talk to you about the article today. And I also wanted to echo what Elois said and thank you all for taking the time to join us today and wish you all the best in these very strange times that we are living in. Um, so as I dive in today, some of you may, some of you may have already guessed from uh, the title of the article, but I am a huge fan of Hamilton and American Musical, so you may see some references as I kind of go through this. Oh, I forgot to turn my captions on. Lois. Um, let's get our captions going. All right, there we go. So, I'm a huge fan of Hamilton, and you're going to see references to that musical as we go through today. You do not need to have listened to the songs in the musical in order to understand what I'm talking about as we go through. But if you haven't had a chance to listen, um, take some time, especially if you're stuck at home, to listen because it's a great show. So, um, my name's Amanda Ziegler, and um, as Lindley said, I'm the Director of Library Services at North Central University. Just so everyone is clear on context, at the time that I wrote this article, uh, I was the online outreach librarian and head of the professional studies library at the University of West Florida. Um, so that was the context in which the curriculum mapping that this article is based on uh, took place. So today, like Lindley said, I'm going to run very quickly through the article. I want to give you a review of what the goals and process were um, for creating the curriculum maps in this case, and then also identify how curriculum maps can be used to maximize outreach instruction, assessment, and coordination with library colleagues. I will just note for anyone who's attending live today or watching this recording shortly after that I really do feel that this project is a great one um, for librarians who may be working remotely during this time to tackle. So I think it is really timely um, way to invest some time in your online programs, um, even while you might be scrambling to help programs that were previously face-to-face -face, uh, do online instruction. This is a good way of giving some love to those programs that have always been online. So. The problems that I was facing uh, at the University of West Florida was that we did not have any kind of structure to our embedded librarian program. We had some librarians and some courses and some programs, but there was no rhyme or reason to who was embedded where. Librarians who weren't already embedded in courses were hesitant to uh, commit to being embedded because they were worried about being overwhelmed by having you know, just tons of faculty members asking them to be embedded in online courses. Um, just for context, about 40% of classes at the time at the University of West Florida were conducted online. 
only 23 of our programs were entirely online, which was a smaller proportion. So there were online courses and non-online programs, if that makes sense. Um, but this, this particular project that I wrote the article based on was focused just on our online, uh, fully online programs. Um, and there were, at the time, entire departments and even some entire colleges that had no library involvement in their online courses at all, um, which you may recognize was an issue for accreditation because we had to be able to show that we were providing the same level of service to our online students as we did to our face-to-face -face students. So I wanted to solve that problem. So um, I decided that what I really needed to do was to get everyone on the same page. Um, everyone has a lot of constituents, obviously, in academic libraries. Um, I know for many people who were in the same type of role that I was at UWF, um, I was in charge of online outreach and instruction, but the actual work of instruction and outreach was being done by subject specialists who were you know, providing that outreach to the departments that they were assigned to. So for instance, um, our health sciences area had a lot of online courses in nursing, but that was not my subject specialty. So I was providing support to another librarian who was doing the actual instruction and outreach there. Um, so you have the other librarians, the teaching faculty, the students, everyone wants what's best for the students but it's hard to make sure that it happens. And by getting everyone on the same page with curriculum maps, I wanted to solve all three of the problems that we had by making it really clear um, note that I do have a little bit of a cough, so I'm gonna try and mute myself before I have to cough so no one has to listen to it. Um, so, how do we go about doing that? So identifying appropriate outcomes. At UWF, we, had, uh, we did not have any kind of institutional learning outcome related to information literacy. But um, we did have academic learning compacts or plans which were on file with the university for each program. So I was able to look for the outcomes at the program level that were related to information literacy. From there, I identified the relevant courses that were related with those programmatic outcomes. And then I had to go out and find the syllabi for those courses and figure out which assignments were being assessed for those outcomes that were related to information literacy. Um, that was a little bit difficult because there were no master courses. I know some universities have that model. Um, but it was a uh, a little bit of an adventure to find all of the different assignments that were related to information literacy. So here's an example of one particular program in career and technical education and the overall academic learning plan for that program, um, which I linked to, and that was available through our Center for Teaching and Learning. So it may be in a different location at your institution, but for um, accreditation, most institutions are going to have these sort of programmatic mappings of program outcomes to courses that you'll be able to find. So <clears throat> you can see where then after I had identified which learning outcomes were tied to information literacy. Then I looked at the courses and what assignments were in those courses and available. Um, 
Some classes had unclear assignments. Some classes didn't have a syllabi posted um, to the institutional portal, even though they were supposed to. And then what was really disheartening once I finished some of the mapping was that I found that uh, our librarians were often embedded in courses that were not the ones that we identified in the process. So then you have to make some decisions about, you know, do you want to leave them in a course that they've historically been embedded in, or do you want to move them to the ones that we've identified? <clears throat> One of the bigger issues that I had was getting librarian buy-in. Um, they had some really relevant concerns about how the program was going to be assessed. Were they going to be judged on the number of courses that they were embedded in, that were identified in this process? How was that going to work? Um, also, how to get a meeting with faculty, which I know is a big issue and probably a question that we'll come back around to later. Um, and what were the talking points that they should approach their departments with? Um, we also, so we use some different um, accreditation things. We were very specific in pulling the language from our accreditor, uh, who is SACS, to make the case for why we needed to do this. We also added current resources that we already had set up in LibGuides and elsewhere to the maps. And um, we agreed in some cases to share assessment that we conducted of learning objects and other you know, related assignments uh, with the departments to aid in their assessment. So <clears throat> with teaching faculty, we really focused on discussing the project in meetings across campus, having the liaisons take the lead in reaching out to their departments because they already had those relationships and connections. Um, and finally, I would really say that having the specific assignments identified for each of the courses that the information literacy outcomes were mapped to was a really important piece of outreach for us because it showed that we had done our homework, we understood what was happening in their courses, and it gave a point of connection that rather than saying, hey, here's something we want you to partner with us on faculty, so <laughs> we work for you and work for me, we were able to say, no, this is what you're already doing. Um, you know, you're already teaching this, you're already assigning and assessing this, and here are some ways that we can provide support for you. <clears throat> um, so in the end, I really want to stress that you get sort of what you put into this process. And so you have to have an idea of what your end goal is before you engage in curriculum mapping. Um, if you engage in curriculum mapping, but you don't know where you want to go with it, um, you can spend a lot of time making really beautiful products, but it may not get you to the end goal, which in this case was for us to really utilize librarian time as effectively as possible to support our, our 23 fully online programs. Um, we did assess the process by looking at the overall number of embedded classes, how many classes we felt we should embed based on the map, and setting up a continuous feedback loop of how well we were engaging with departments that had, you know, these, these as sort of identified assessment points. Um, as far as assessing instruction, we did get some new connections to departmental assessment data. And one thing I think overall that was really helpful was there was a lot more awareness amongst our faculty that we wanted to be involved in seeing the assessment data from the assignments and assessment that they were already doing, um, and that we were also, in some cases, willing to help grade those assignments, which was really appreciated. Um, so if you want to be in the room where it happens and embedded in online courses or providing support for online courses where you know that that in information literacy instruction is really needed, 
Um, you need to think through what documents and tools you have access to already. Who, you know, how can you get them? Who needs to make them? What information matters to you and your institution? Because it may not be the same information that I uh, gathered at UWF. Um, and then really looking at outcomes, courses, assignments. So thanks to Lin-Manuel Miranda for providing the inspiration for my title and the slides. Um, and then I am ready to answer some questions. Thank you so much, Amanda. All attendees, please feel free to enter your questions in the chat. I'll go ahead and kick off with some questions that our committee came up with for Amanda. So the first one up is, do you see the curriculum mapping that you did as being scalable if there ended up being more online only programs at your school? If so, how would you envision handling the increased number of classes? Or if not, how do you think you'd prioritize which classes would receive the mapping? So this is actually a really interesting question to me. Um, <clears throat> Because as I, as I mentioned at University of West Florida, we had 23 online programs. Um, and I, I did feel at the time that this was pretty scalable. Um, but then shortly after I finished this article, uh, I moved to North Central University, which is 100% online. And so um, I had to sort of realize that um, it could be a little more difficult in a completely online environment. Um, but we have actually been doing some of this at NCU. And I've found that it's been pretty successful. The way that we've chosen to prioritize um, is honestly based on uh, faculty and curriculum director interest in having embedded information literacy because we have certain schools that are just more interested in working with us and more flexible about making, um, you know, adjustments or additions to their curriculum to support information literacy. So that's how we've chosen to prioritize. And I do think that faculty buy-in piece is very important. Um, but I think there are a lot of different things you could use to prioritize. You could use the number of students who are enrolled in a particular program. Um, you know, if you have one, program that has a disproportionate number of enrollees, that's obviously going to give you a lot more bang for your buck. Um, so it may be one where you already have a great relationship with a particular department, or you might choose to prioritize a department where you don't have a great relationship already, so because you really want to build that outreach. So what I would say is if you feel a little overwhelmed by the number of programs that you would need to do this for, I would really think about, again, what is your goal in doing this? You know, do you want to strengthen relationships that you already have, create new ones, affect the most number of students? Think about what those goals are and then make your choices about prioritization based on that. Thanks, that's really helpful. I know we all kind of deal with issues of scale. So having a couple of metrics to go by is really useful. Okay, so a second question we have is that your article stated that curriculum maps provided a clear starting point for discussions with individual departments and administrative stakeholders. How was the library led push for curriculum mapping received? Do you have any advice on partnering with departments, faculty and administrators on a mapping project? So at the University of West Florida, I would say it was overall, there was a lot of positivity around it, but um, in some departments, that positivity meant that uh, I and the liaison librarian were invited into a department meeting and they listened to what we have to say and said, oh, that's really nice, and then never talked to us about it again. Um, but we did also have, um, you know, some really enthusiastic departments that immediately jumped on it and were super excited about the opportunities. Um, so what I would say is don't be discouraged if you don't get a super positive reaction right away and um, keep reaching out to departments because sometimes it's just a matter of what else do they have on their plate right now. You know, um, 
sometimes there's faculty turnover in departments and then you get a, a different reaction than maybe what you previously had. I will also say that one of the advantages of the way that I did this was that we had, again, those specific assignments and we went in with specific ideas for ways to support that. Because if you say embedded librarian to most teaching faculty, they don't have a clue about what you're talking about. It doesn't, it's not meaningful to them. But if you're able to say, I'm willing to be in your class discussions and you know do question and answer with the students, or I'm willing to design a video tutorial or a you know lib wizard or other interactive tutorial, and you can show them actual examples, that was probably the most helpful thing that we did. Um, the departments where we had really specific examples where we could show them, um, that's where we saw the most buy-in. Great, so to sort of piggyback off of that, is there a particular course or assignment that you could share about how you mapped the framework to that course or assignment? Yeah, so one of the ones that I talked about in, um, in the article specifically is career and technical education, which was a bachelor's program. Um, and they had some program learning outcomes where it was a little bit tougher. Um, you know, sometimes when I looked at the program learning outcomes, it was really clear which ones were information literacy related. Um, other times, like with that particular program, it was a little tougher. Um, in that case, the two that I chose, um, one was to um, analyze data gathered from a variety of sources, including formal and informal measures to develop goals. So obviously talking about sources, talking about different types of sources. Um, and then the other one, let's see, was to communicate accurately um, and effectively through the written word. So in that case, you know, the the link isn't quite as clear to information literacy until you start to look at the framework and then you're seeing scholarship as conversation and how can you help the students understand that they are not just passively taking in that scholarship, but they're contributing to the conversation through their assignments. Um, and so in that particular case, um, that also helped to identify then within the course because I knew that I was looking for, um, you know, authority is constructed and contextual as one of the frames and then also scholarship as conversation as another frame. That allowed me to look at the assignments within the course and identify some where I could directly apply those frames. Um, because otherwise, you know, sometimes, especially I, I found with the undergraduate courses, um, it was difficult to see which assignments were gonna be the most impactful. So thank you. So another question is, could you describe how programmatic assessment has strengthened or could strengthen as a result of curriculum mapping? So programmatic assessment, um, and I'm not sure if you know, Lindley, with this one, if, if the question is kind of driving more towards programmatic assessment of the library's information literacy program or programmatic assessment for the academic departments, but I, I kind of have an answer for both pieces, so I'll, I'll hit them both. Um, so I did leave UWF shortly after this was implemented, so I'm not 100% sure kind of where it's gone there, but I know um, from the library perspective with what we've put together, you know, started to put together at North Central, that has kind of been a similar process to this. Um, it's really allowed us to do, um, to show a co-curricular um, assessment of student learning in a way that we were not able to otherwise, you know, it gets you beyond just counting interactions and number of attendees and allows you to be able to report about actual differences in you know, students who are in a course that has an embedded library presence, whatever form that takes, 
um, versus students who are not in those courses. Um, and we've been able to compare GPA, retention rates, all kinds of things that have really been able to show the impact of the library and our programs. Um, so from the library perspective, I'd say that. And I would say uh, from the departmental perspective, um, it has really opened up conversations about what is information literacy, because as I mentioned at North Central, we do have an institutional learning outcome related to that. And so sometimes I've found as we've been going in and doing and having some of these discussions that things that were mapped for information literacy were not the things that I would have mapped <laughs> to information literacy. And so um, I think that's opened up conversations with faculty members and strengthened the departmental assessments because rather than assessing something where a student really wasn't picking up any new IL skills, now they're maybe transferring that a little bit, so. It's fantastic that I sort of got those conversations happening. So another question we had was that in your article, you mentioned that um, online courses had kind of been historically underrepresented in information literacy efforts at the university. Do you think that this is typical at other institutions as well? And why or why not? Yeah, so I definitely think that typically at most institutions, um, information literacy efforts in online courses have been underrepresented. I think it's getting better. Um, but I know at UWF, one of the issues was, um, you know, as programs moved online, the face-to-face -face instruction that we did was pretty centered around the one-shot, you know, a, a typical one-shot structure where the students came in, we talked to them, or we went to the classroom and talked to them, and then that was it. Um, and that is a hard thing, I think, to replicate in an online environment, because particularly, um, you know, almost all of the online programs at UWF were asynchronous. At North Central, all of our programs are asynchronous. So you're not hopping in a Zoom room like we are now and presenting to the students. And so I think um, if I had to, if I had to diagnose the reasons, I would say, um, one, a, a lack of, you know, applied imagination, I guess, about how we could do things in those classes, but also I will say just demands on librarian time. I'm sure everyone can identify with that. Um, you know, if you're teaching dozens and dozens of one-shot instruction sessions per semester for face-to-face -face classes, being told that you also need to answer discussion board questions or, you know, build a video tutorial, which is not the five minute process that people seem to think it is, you know, doing those things for online classes, it, it's a time, you know, it can be a time issue. And I would also say a training issue um, at UWF specifically, you know, we had librarians who were not familiar with screencasting tools or didn't understand how to use our learning management system. And so helping them to get over that, uh, that barrier of, of understanding how to use the tools. Thank you for that insight. So we have a question that might be particularly relevant because many librarians may be online now for the first time, but are there any ways that curriculum mapping for online programs might be different than for in-person programs? Yeah, so this, um, so I would say at UWF, it didn't end up being super different from curriculum mapping that we had done for in-person programs. But one thing I found um, when I moved to North Central is that our faculty are almost, our, our faculty are also 100% remote. And so it was a little bit tougher to identify who are the people that I need to talk to about this. Um, so I think that is one challenge. And it, I think also, you know, for this moment that we're in, I think it engaging in this kind of project is a valuable outreach tool because it gives you a reason to email all of those faculty members that you might otherwise see, you know, when they come to the coffee shop in the library or, you know, you're walking across campus and you say hi to your, um, you know, department head for your liaison area or whatever, um, 
since you're not having those interactions, this is a great way of staying engaged with them because you're able to send those emails, reach out, say, hey, we're looking at this. You know, we'd love to take some time to talk with you all about it, set up a video conference, you know, whatever works uh, at your institution. So that, that I would say, I, I don't think there's a fundamental difference in the process, but I do think there are some differences in just figuring out who you need to talk to and how to get them around a, a virtual table. Thanks. So another question is that it appeared the curriculum mapping was done for both undergraduate and graduate programs. Were there any differences or surprises in how that process unfolded at the two levels? Yeah, so one of the things, um, and I, I did note this in the article, but for most of the programs, there were either two or three sort of um, courses that could be mapped, or for some, there were like five or six that could be mapped. Um, and there were not really a lot in the middle in that four to five range. One of the things that surprised me, because if you had told me that information and then asked me to guess what the difference was between those programs that had fewer courses that mapped and those that had more, I would have told you, oh, it's gonna be the graduate program that has more mapped to information literacy obviously and the the undergraduate you know programs are going to have fewer outcomes that map to that or courses that map to those outcomes um and that was not true it was really a mixed bag um really dependent on the individual program and so that was one thing that that did surprise me that was a difference um i would also say the other thing that surprised me um was when I think back about it, um, the undergraduate level was sometimes more difficult to isolate a particular assignment that needed support. Uh, at the graduate level, you know, there tended to be these sort of centerpiece assignments. You know what I mean? Like there was a, a literature review that they had to do at the end of it, or you know, in for the doctoral program that I was. Um, mapping, you know, there were very clear checkpoints that were building towards their dissertation work. Um, and so those were easy to see at the undergraduate level. Um, sometimes they had an assignment that was mapped to that outcome that really didn't have an information literacy piece at all. Um, and so sort of figuring out which assignment made the most sense uh, within within the course, I would say was a little bit tougher for me for the undergraduate programs. Thanks. All right, we're gonna to shift to some audience questions that have been submitted. So we had one that asked, is scalability related in part to the role of the librarian each course? Embedded assumes a very high level of involvement, perhaps even daily in each course, or by embedded, did you mean something different? Yeah, so I think that's a really good point, um, is understanding sort of what your institutional view of embedded librarian means. And I do know that at some institutions, that means, you know, the, the librarian is in the course from start to finish. They maybe have a, a discussion board or a question area where students can ask, you know, questions all through the course. And that was one of the conversations that doing this mapping really allowed us to have with the liaison librarians. Um, because if you were a liaison librarian that, you know, we completed this process and then we're looking at each individual person, there were some people who had, you know, only a handful of online programs, only a handful of courses. And so maybe it was possible for them to have more of that, you know, whole semester embedded experience where they could do more in each course versus someone who had virtually all of their programs that they were liaising with were online programs that had, you know, for some of those, those were like the high number courses where there were five or six courses that mapped, you know, per program. And so for those folks, maybe what being embedded in those courses ended up looking like was making a learning object that was going to go into that course. Um, whether that was like an articulate or a lib wizard or a you know, video tutorial and having that, um, 
I was one of those librarians, be, obviously because of my job at the, at the time, that had mostly online programs. And one of the things I did was to um, limit my involvement in discussion boards and classes to the week or two prior to that sort of identified assignment that we were focusing on. Um, and that was really helpful just for from a time management perspective, because I knew which weeks I was going to be in the course. I knew how many courses I was going to be in at a time, and I could balance that a little bit. So I would say, um, I know that, you know, that, that definition can kind of vary institution to institution, but think about what makes the most sense for you and your colleagues. Thank you. So another audience question. How much education about and translation of was needed to give faculty the bridge between course or program student learning outcomes and the ACRL framework? <laughs> um, a lot in some cases. Um, I will say at UWF, um, we focused more on kind of using the program outcomes that were already there and helping them understand just sort of how they related to information literacy in general without pulling in the specifics about the framework as much. Um, so like we did a lot of that translation work and it was there in what we were saying to them, but we didn't say, and that's part of scholarship is conversation because it didn't mean anything to the faculty uh, that we were working with necessarily. Um, at North Central, um, the librarians have actually been this year doing a really extensive webinar series for our faculty about the framework and specifically talking about each frame, breaking down the literature behind it, talking about different ways that that can be incorporated in assignments um, within our curriculum. And that has been a really good tool, um, not only just you know for the faculty who've attended that series, but also um, when we have questions pop up about things, uh, which happened the other day with a, a particular program, we were able to send the subject matter expert who's working on some course development stuff links to you know, all of these resources around the framework that we had put together for our faculty. So I think that if you can put together those resources that help bridge that gap, it is really helpful if you think that asking them to learn a specific framework is going to be a barrier to your outreach, then I would focus on speaking their language as much as, much as possible. That's a lot of sense, thank you. So another question was, were the instructors you worked with mostly full-time faculty? Uh, the ASKER has a lot of adjuncts teaching in their online programs, and sometimes it's hard to engage or organize them for curriculum mapping. Any tips for organizing a variety of faculty teaching all over the country? Okay, so <laughs> in at UWF, the folks that we worked with were mostly full-time faculty. Um, and we really focused our initial outreach on the department heads, because what we found was that if the department head was on board, they would often require their faculty, whether they were full-time or adjunct, to um, listen to us and work with us and start incorporating us into their courses. Um, and if we didn't have that buy-in from the department head, then we didn't really get anywhere. Um, but I will say, you know, especially in a high adjunct environment, um, I think recognizing that they have limited time, that they really want to see how it's going to apply to the students who are in the courses that they're teaching right now is really important. So rather than, um, in that case, rather than approaching them from the outset and saying, you know, we want your input about these things, go to them with a product already. Grow, to, you know, go to them with some idea of which courses you want to target and which assignments you want to target if you if you can get to that kind of syllabus level stuff um, because that allows you to have a much more focused conversation and you're not asking for things from them then you're you're offering support for them um, i think that that is an easier way to get them engaged as far as you know faculty teaching all over the country that is definitely something 
but that's exactly the situation that we have at NCU. And um, I would say just, you know, being really clear and transparent in communications, keeping your emails short and sweet. Um, people, if you send, you know, the Magna Carta, people are not going to read all the way through it. Um, I try to always, you know, summarize bullet points, um, make sure that you're very upfront, like the first two lines of the email or whatever you're sending about, you know, this is how this is going to help you. Here's what I need back from you in order to, you know, move forward with this. Um, I would also say, you know, utilize whatever tools your institution has, um, whether that's video conferencing or, you know, at, at North Central, we have sort of like a social media platform for students and faculty called the Commons, and that's separate from the learning management system. And so we really try to engage uh, with faculty members within the Commons um, so that we can kind of reach out to them outside of, you know, email and the LMS, which feel more work-like. So whatever those kind of tools that you have at your disposal, utilize them as well. Great, thank you. So just a reminder to all of our participants, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat. In the meantime, I have one that I'm kind of jumping off a previous response of yours. Um, you may not be able to answer this because you switched institutions, but when you were talking about liaisons sort of having varying levels of courses that had you know, different information literacy outcomes. Was there ever any thought that that might sort of reflect differences, like switching up liaison roles perhaps, that they might switch subjects to kind of balance the load a bit? Or was that not something that was really on the table? Yeah, so um, <laughs> that's a really good question. And I don't 100% know what happened with those conversations um, after I left. But at UWF, we had sort of traded, you know, liaison areas around at different times as people, you know, people come and go, people move into a new role. Um, and so we did have a discussion at the time about the fact that this was a really good way of identifying um, and sort of balancing that so that what we didn't, what we really didn't want was um, and I'll just use, so, you know, English had the composition classes, that liaison department had the composition classes, lots of face-to-face -face one shots, two shots, three shots, you know, depending on, on the program and the course. Um, so we didn't want to pair that with like, not that you would probably have someone liaising to these departments anyway, but like English and health sciences, where we had a lot of embedded instruction happening you know, that was a bad mix. Um, so that it did allow us to do sort of some, some load balancing and have those discussions about, you know, this person is doing really the bulk of online, you know, instruction, and they also have these high demand face-to-face -face instruction courses. How do we want to balance that? In other, um, so I'll, I'll use the example of the liaison departments that I actually had. Um, most of my online instruction happened later in the semester because I was focusing on those kind of key assignments. And most of my in-person instruction, which was for the social work department, um, was happening very early in the semester in the first like three weeks. Um, so that actually ended up balancing really well. So I, I think that it can be a tool that can be used to figure that out and kind of balance workload. Thanks. So we have another audience question. So if you identified a course or assignment that supported information literacy learning or depended upon it, did you include it on the map? For those programs that had five or six assignments or courses, was there any prioritization based on enrollment, whether the course was required or an elective or so on? No, that's a really great question. Um, so we did include the assignments on the map. Um, again, at UWF, there was no master course. So um, it could really vary from semester to semester and syllabus to syllabus what the actual keystone assignment was. And so what we tried to do was make a note and then 
in each map, um, I would just always put a note for the liaison librarian that said, be sure to check the syllabi for this semester. Um, if it was a course where I had seen, you know, a fair amount of variation about what the assignments were from semester to semester. Um, and so, you know, I did include the assignments on the map, but that didn't mean that the assignment I included on the map was always the one that was actually being <laughs> taught and, and given in the course each semester. Um, and for the programs that had five or six, um, we did prioritize. And that was really, I think, one of the areas of productive discussion with the departments was to be able to go to them and say, hey, you know, these are the part or these are the courses in your program that we've identified and the assignments that we've identified. We really only have, you know, the, the librarian availability to, you know, do embedded instruction in two of these, or we can come up with tutorials for three of these courses and have, you know, sort of that traditional embedded librarian in discussions for two others. How would you want that to work? Like, what do you, what would your preference be um, as a department? And so we really went with the sort of the, the will of the department in those cases. Um, I'll also say, you know, um, at North Central, as we've been going through a somewhat similar process to identify and embed instruction, we have really been looking at both enrollment, um, whether it's a required course or an elective course. Um, the other thing I've, we've also tried to prioritize is um, introductory courses. Uh, North Central is primarily a graduate institution. And what we found is that we really wanna get to the students early in their program to lay that foundation. Um, so if I have a choice between embedding, you know, library content in a course that students would take, you know, maybe as their second course versus one they're gonna take as their sixth, I'm gonna pick the, the earlier course for sure. Great, thank you. So we probably have time for one more question submitted from the audience and I have one that I can, can toss out in the meantime, which is since you've kind of done this at two institutions now, what do you think was the biggest thing you learned or that you would have, you know, did differently after your first experience? Um, I think the, <laughs> well, uh, I'll, I'll straight out say the, the easier thing at NCU has been, um, you know, I'm the director. And so I'm like, hey, let's look at this. Let's figure out which courses. Um, and at UWF, you know, I was talking to colleagues who were at the same level that I was. And so I had to spend a lot more time creating buy-in and getting people to see the need to be reaching out to their online courses because in a lot of cases they were like, oh, well, you know, I have a good relationship with that faculty member. Well, what they meant by that was they did in-person instruction for that faculty member, but they did nothing for the same course for the online sections. And so, you know, sort of navigating that um, was definitely difficult. So I would say for people who aren't in who are in that same sort of um, coordinator type position that I was in at UWF to um, really work on getting that buy-in from your colleagues and especially um, buy-in from your administrators who can encourage your colleagues to have buy-in if they are not on board, which all my colleagues at UWF were, but I, I know, you know, other people, other institutions, that can sometimes be a challenge, so. All right, great, thank you. So I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Maybe hand it over to Tracy to, to do a little final wrap up. Thanks a lot, Lindley. And thank you, Amanda, for um, doing such a fine presentation under such challenging circumstances, including with a cold. <laughs> Um, big stars all around from all of us. Um, lots of clapping. <laughs> lots of virtual clapping is going on. Um, thank you so much.
And uh, I just want to thank North Central too. I know you're the director, but still, <laughs> we want to thank the institution for giving you the time out of your work day to do this for us. So thank you very much for sharing your, your expertise and your anecdotes and tips for how we can all do this at our institutions. Uh, I just would like to say to the audience, um, if you came in a little bit late, you might have missed this. The recording of this session will be sent out um, next week. Uh, so please look for that in your email. And I would like to thank Elois Sharp from ACRL for doing such a great job today, um, keeping us on track and making sure everything could be heard um, and the recording went smoothly. I'd also like to thank um, our ACRL committee, uh, our distance learning section um, committee, research and publications. Um, thank everybody on the committee for helping with today's session and um, just ask one more time if there are any questions or comments for Amanda or for any of us here. Yes, wash your hands, says Anne Hansalt. <laughs> Good advice as always. Social distancing, yep. Anything else to wrap up today? Okay, Elois, I think we are ready to turn off the recording. Thanks everyone.